to see the possibility, the idea that what began years ago as maybe people in Taos um, would be able to get a radio station, maybe a TV station, that maybe uh, became a real possibility and now you are raising money, you've gotten the licenses, it is truly something. You know, Dennis has taught me something over the years, is that there's a word in the dictionary that actually has no meaning, and it's impossible. And I think uh, Robin has realized that today. Everything is possible. Martinez Hall. I understand this is the big, first big mass event and that she has just returned from Germany and is staying up for this to see the possibilities in her own space. So let us today consecrate this as a sanctuary of dissent. <laughs> once again be here with Moby Dickens and to know that through these years that we've come here that Moby Dickens continues. I don't take that for granted at all. So many independent bookstores have been shuttered over the years and the fact that they are still here, I too see bookstores, these places where you go in, where you can travel the world, continents, um, centuries without actually physically going anywhere, but just letting your mind wander as you open these books. Like libraries, I see them as oases of dissent, and I'm so honored to be able to work with them again. And I hope you buy as many books as you'd like to buy, because, you know, as Dennis was describing, when these books are driven up the bestseller list, there are many bookstores, unlike Moby Dickens, that only buy the top bestsellers, and thank goodness they don't. That's the only thing, and there are very few books then that line their walls. So people go in and they see those books, and they don't know there's anything else out there. And the publishers then, it's a vicious cycle, only will publish those kinds of books. And if we can show them that there are other books that point, kind of serve as a kind of roadmap to, uh, to another world, to another world that envisions what is possible. I think that ultimately is what we dream. And there are books that do that. And that's why we travel the country and also shore up Democracy Now!, which shores up stations like, well, the imminent KCEI and KCEY. I can't believe we're already saying those call letters. So you get two books. You get a wonderful hour with Michael Moore on Democracy Now!, talking about his life. Um, think about holidays, birthdays, graduations, whatever you would like, and we'll be signing afterwards. It's also just a wonderful opportunity to get to meet you, and whether or not you get a book, come up and say hi if you can stand being up that late. Um, and Dennis has just learned something very big in the last hour. Dennis is a remarkable organizer. Um, just before he left on this 100-city tour, um, he learned in his neighborhood in Denver uh, that a Walmart superstore was about to be built. And he went to a meeting, about 400 people were there, uh, the neighbors and the community. And um, he saw there was tremendous rage, you know, overwhelming majority of them were opposed. They didn't want their neighborhood changed in this way. And yet there's a certain sense of powerlessness, even with hundreds of people. The developer started his uh, PowerPoint presentation, and people were frustrated, they were upset. And Dennis thought, well, how will this be channeled? The only one handing out, you know, the sign-up sheets was the developer. And so he, as the PowerPoint presentation was beginning, he knew the story. He didn't have to see the PowerPoint demonstration. He went across the street to a Xerox store, to a Kinko's, I think it was, or to a UPS, whatever it was, where he could make some copies. He registered a website. 
He made then copies, 10 to a page, of little slivers. He looked for a stop, uh, walmart.com that was already taken, and so he went to stopwalmartcolorado.com. That seemed to work. Um, he set up the website, he set up the server. This all takes about 15 minutes. It looks like a very large organization, you see. And um, he makes hundreds of flyers that show the website and uh, show a contact number. Comes back into the meeting, the, blue, the um, PowerPoint presentation is just wrapping up. And he starts to hand out these flyers to everyone. And everyone is signing up. Everyone is calling. Uh, there is a large meeting that gathers. And what Walmart wanted right there, what the developer wanted on this corner, I think it was Colorado Avenue and 9th or something, um, was not only to build there, not only to get permission from the city council and all to build there, but to be tax subsidized, taxpayer subsidized, that the neighbors would feel privileged to have their store on their corner, or they would go to another corner or another community, which is what the neighbors um, were encouraging them to do. Actually, they were very altruistic, and they were not encouraging them to go anywhere. Um, and although the powers that be, you know, the whole Walmart, uh, um, fortune uh, goes into deregulation, right? Less government. When it comes down to it, they want full government subsidies to bring their stores in. And so people organized. And um, Dennis, I believe, had something to do with the with buying 100 Stop Walmart lawn signs. He was already now gone on the tour. And suddenly people were sending him pictures. There would be one Walmart, stop Walmart sign on someone's lawn, then 10, then 100. When we came into town this past week, because we went all through Colorado, we went down streets where every single, you know, it would be political signs for various candidates, and they would be different ones, some Republican, some Democrat, you know, for everyone from the lower level council member to president. But everywhere, there were stop Walmart signs. And then they bought another thousand of those signs. And the city council members then in the area, because the whole city council was looking to the two in that area out of respect. Whatever they wanted, the rest of the city council would uh, go by. Uh, just about a week ago, they announced that they would not be supporting uh, the subsidization of Walmart in the neighborhood. So, Dennis is uh, very careful, and he said, well, that's half the battle. They won't get government subsidy. But they're not going to want to lose this battle, and so they'll build without government subsidy unless we stop them, he said. People were organizing every walk of life, every political persuasion in the neighborhood. And just as we pulled up into the parking lot, he got a call from some fellow Denverites who said, Dennis, we have some news for you. Walmart announced an hour ago they will not build um, their, in their neighborhood of Denver, Colorado. <laughs> And these campaigns, we will be talking about Walmart tomorrow and democracy now and various uh, worker actions that have been taking place. But these campaigns are not negative campaigns. And this is what the power is. Not about you can't build your store. These campaigns are about building community. And that is why they are so effective. They're about saving the mom and pop store on the corner. They're about saving the Moby Dickens down the street. They're about saving community, about saving the workers being who need to be treated right, need to be paid fairly. Because these large, large, large stores, though their owners fight any kind of regulation, and they fight the expansion, what they call, of government, big government. Many of the workers who work in these stores have to be subsidized 
by the government. Many of the workers who work in these stores are below poverty level. And so, in fact, you are subsidizing Walmart every step of the way. And it's been a very interesting, enlightening, um, you know, sort of journalistic look that we've been taking at Democracy Now! about how these community efforts go. So that's just a little uh, comment about my colleague, Dennis Moynihan, who is uh, truly a remarkable organizer, a wonderful writer, a deep researcher, and uh, this book wouldn't have been possible without him, as well as the growth of Democracy Now!, which began 16 years ago as the only daily election show in the public broadcast. dozen community radio stations, KUNM, picked us up very early on. Um, and right around this week of September 11, 2001, we started on our first TV station. It was Manhattan Neighborhood Network in the middle of New York City. Um, and as soon as we went on the station as emergency broadcasting, the closest national broadcast to Ground Zero, we worked out of a big old firehouse just blocks from Ground Zero. Other TV stations started saying, can we run you? And we would then send out the video cassette. Remember video cassettes? And, but snail mail was too slow. I mean, this is breaking news, so we FedExed them. And then the mailmen would be coming, and the FedEx guys, and they'd have garbage bags filled with these video cassettes until we were able to use satellite. But also, we perfected a way from the very beginning to send broadcast quality video through the internet because we couldn't always afford the satellites that the big networks used. But we knew it was critical to be on television because that's where many people uh, get their information. And so we began on a few dozen community radio stations in 1996 and now we're broadcasting on over 1,100 public radio and television stations, increasingly on PBS stations and NPR stations, and on both satellite networks, Dish Network, and um, uh, Dish Network, Channel 9415, Free Speech TV, 9410, Link TV, and on Direct TV, uh, both, Dish, both Free Speech TV and Link. And I hope that you pick up these, pick up mounds of them, and leave them around. Um, you uh, you can pin them up in coffee shops and laundromats and at your places of worship, wherever they may be, to let people know about the Places Democracy Now! broadcast, which is a roadmap of the independent media in your community. And I really love that we had to make some additions on this flyer. We couldn't use the old one from last time. Coming soon, KCEI 90.1 FM and KCEY 89.5 FM. I originally come from Pacifica Radio, which was founded more than 60 years ago by a man named Lou Hill, who came out of the detention camps after World War II. He was a conscientious objector and said, there's got to be a media outlet that's not run by corporations that profit from war, but run by journalists and artists. And so Pacifica was born. The first station, KPFA in Berkeley, 1949. 1959, KPFA in Los Angeles. Feel free to applaud. 1960, WBAI, New York, my station. 1977, KP, uh, WB, WPFW in 1970, KPFD. I just met some folks at the reception who came from Houston, and yes, they were listeners uh, to that station. KPFD is a special station in the Petro Metro. 1970, they went on the air, and in a few weeks, in a few weeks, they were the only station to be blown up. The transmitter was blown up by the Ku Klux Klan. And um, they strapped dynamite to the base of the transmitter and blew it to smithereens. And then the silver lining was that, you know, um, I don't know how people keep their hands clean. I always, I hold these pens, I don't know if someone has a solution, but usually, this is very clean, by the way, for me. Um, but, um, they blew the the transmitter up, and um, 
it's not as if Pacific had money for advertising, so the silver lining was they blew it into the consciousness of the potential listening audience of the people of Houston. <laughs> but when they got back on their feet, which they soon did, right in the middle of Arlo Guthrie singing Alice's Restaurant, they blew it up again. Now, I can't remember if it was the Grand Dragon, the Exalted Cyclops, or the Imperial Wizard, because I often confuse their titles. But he said it was his proudest act. I think it is because he understood how dangerous Pacifica is, how dangerous independent media is, how dangerous KCEI and KCEY will soon be. Because they allow people to speak for themselves. And when you hear someone speaking from their own experience, whether it is a Palestinian child or an Israeli grandmother, whether it is an Afghan aunt or an uncle in Iraq, that breaks down bigotry. It challenges the stereotypes and the caricatures that fuel the hate groups. I believe the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, it is wielded as a weapon of war. Now, in World War II, the Secretary of War was Henry Stimson. I must tell the story here because we are so close to Los Alamos, where we will be broadcasting from on Thursday. This has been... an amazing journey to bring you the voices of people at the grassroots all over this country. I could spend the entire talk just talking about the journey we have taken in this last few months. Um, bringing out the voices of people in their communities instead of what you get on the networks. The small circle of pundits who know so little about so much explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. <laughs> Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War in World War II. He has handed a list of Japanese cities to drop the first atomic bombs in the world may just down the road from here at Los Alamos. He looks at the list. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Kyoto. No, he crosses out Kyoto. Why? Because he and Mrs. Stimson had visited Kyoto. They had loved the people. The landmarks were magnificent, the food delicious. And he knew this place, and he said no. If only the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki were lucky enough to host the Stimsons. I mean, the profound point that this raises. He knew this place, and so he didn't want to destroy it. That is the power of independent media. I mean, how do we learn about the world? We learn about it from our families, from friends, but mostly in the rest of the world, we learn about it through the media, and it must be through something other than a corporate lens. And equally important, and especially when it comes to national security, the rest of the world must see us through something other than a corporate lens. I see the media as a huge kitchen table that stretches across the globe, that we all sit around and debate and discuss the most important issues of the day, war and peace, life and death, and anything less than that is a disservice to the service men and women of this country. They can't have these debates on military bases. They rely on us in civilian society to have the discussions that lead to the decisions about whether they live or die whether they are sent to kill or be killed. Anything less than that is a disservice to a democratic society.
so this journey we have taken, I don't know if we're at 40 or 45 cities, whatever it is, I consider it a tremendous accomplishment until someone recently said to me, oh, so you only have like 60 to go? <laughs> a very negative comment. <laughs> but it's not that bad. I mean, this weekend, we started in Salida. We slid into Salida at 9 a.m. and then to Carbondale at noon where the... Um, what were the, the uh, avocado, exotic avocado maker made salads for everyone in Carbondale Town Hall. And then we made our way to Paonia at 4.30. And then we were going into Carbondale uh, to Crested Butte for an evening talk. Last time we went, we came in by snowmobile, the uh, DJs of KBUT, some call it KBUT, um, met us right before the Kepler Pass. We rode over and passed the largest living organism in the world, right? The aspen trees that are all connected. And we rode into Crested Butte and we did this fundraiser for KBUT and my feet were frozen through the entire talk. <laughs> um, and then this was the most amazing thing. Uh, someone invited us that night, because we never know we're going to stay, into a space capsule to go to sleep. And it truly was. I don't know, rumor has it Neil Armstrong built it, but it was a space capsule Swiss chalet. And that's where we stayed that night. Then the next morning we went and made our way to Telluride, and at night we spoke in Durango, and we broadcast from Fort Lewis College on Monday morning and Tuesday morning. The four-year college that graduates more Native American students than any college in the United States. So what better day to broadcast from Fort Lewis when they were honoring the Day of the Americas? Some of you might call it Columbus Day. Um, and we brought on uh, members of the White Mountain Apache tribe and the Navajo tribe and talked about um, what does Columbus mean to them? Now, we had flown into Colorado last week from, from Washington, D.C. We had driven all night to get to D.C. because we were in Blacksburg, Virginia the night before. Why Blacksburg? We went to Virginia Tech. Because the Brady campaign against gun violence, you know, Jim Brady, who was shot in the head when... Um, during the attempted assassination of President Reagan and then started the center uh, with his wife, Sarah. They were leading a campaign to get Jim Lehrer, the PBS anchor and moderator of the first debate, to ask a question about gun violence, especially because the first presidential debate was in Colorado, where the Aurora massacre just took place in a decade ago, the Columbine shooting seemed like it was a pretty obvious question to ask. And so we went to Virginia Tech because one of the people leading that campaign is a young man named Colin Goddard who came down while we were there. He survived the Virginia Tech shooting. Colin is a remarkable young man. He was shot four times in the hips and the shoulders and he took us to Norris Hall and we he just retraced his steps that morning in 2007 when he didn't want to go to French class. He was thinking he'd play hooky and go at breakfast, but then he thought better of it. And he came in late, but he came to class. And his French professor rolled her eyes, as she always did with Colin. And um, they started the lessons. And about halfway through, a young woman named Rachel, a student, the best student in the class, came in. And like Colin is looking at her, he had never come in before Rachel. And she was very frazzled, and she said, I'm so sorry I'm late. Uh, my dorm was shut down. They wouldn't let us leave because there was a shooting in our dorm. And he said, the whole class said, what are you talking about? We don't know anything about a shooting. And then before they're done talking about this, as she sits down, they hear that uh, sound of, uh, like, sort of fireworks crackling, hitting. And they think it's construction outside, but then it's getting closer, and it's the snapping, the crackle of gunshot. And the teacher, the French professor, looks quickly out the door. She yells to the kids, get under your desks. She's killed. And the shooter comes in. They're all under their desks. And Colin describes, and some of you might have heard this on Democracy Now! this past week because we had 
Colin just reenacted it for us. He pulled his phone out. He said, I've never done this before. My next cell phone, I called 911. I said, quick, Norris Hall, there's a shooting. And they said, where's Norris Hall? And he said, Norris Hall at Virginia Tech. There's a shooting. Where's Virginia Tech? Virginia Tech in Blacksburg. Blacksburg where? Blacksburg, Virginia. Where is that? His phone goes through to some other place, even though it's 911. And he quickly says, I'm desperate, we have a shooting, and they do eventually connect him. He's under the desk, and somehow his phone gets shot out of his hand. And he didn't know until much later that the young woman next to him had grabbed the phone and was describing the whole thing, whispering on the phone under her desk. The shooter comes in, there's 16 people in the class, including the professor. He kills nine of them and shoots up the others. That's Colin's description. And as we walk through Norris Hall, it's typical high school or college, you know, cinder block walls, tile floors, but this hall has now changed. They've made it beautiful wood floors and they've turned this whole area into a center for peace and nonviolence. But right before I talked to Colin, I went over to Nikki Giovanni's office. She is a great poet and a university distinguished professor at Virginia Tech. She told her story. I asked her about the shooting, but I knew she doesn't like to talk about the shooting at all. She had been in San Francisco at the time, and she was at some big meeting. And before the shooting occurred, she said, I'll be leaving now, and she jumped on a plane. She didn't know why, she said. She knew she had to get home. The shooting had not happened yet. And she flew across the country, gets in her car, is driving to Blacksburg, sees a local TV station shoot by at about 120 miles an hour in their car. And the police have closed off the Blacksburg exit. She can't go to be Virginia Tech. <clears throat> and so she heads home and she turns on the radio and she hears there's been a shooting and she says, it's Cho, it's Cho. Who's Cho? Cho was the shooter. She taught him poetry. She had taught him a few years before, but she had said he was mean and menacing. She said she had reached so many troubled students. Kids with autism, kids with Tourette's, kids just having a hard time. And she said never did she ever put someone who was troubled out of her class. But she said this was different. He wore sunglasses, a hat over his face. He would not respond. She was scared. And she said to him, I want you out of my class. And he said no. And she said, that's okay. He said, you can't make me. She said, it's true. I can't. So I will resign. And she went to the head of her department and said, it's either him or me. And she said, I'm okay, I'll resign. It wouldn't be, I think it was about a year or two before he did this, going on to harass and menace women on campus. If only all of this was taken seriously. The way Colin Garter described this young man who was shot up, whose friends were killed, and talked about if only we'd known how troubled he was, though the signs were, not to mention the fact that he could legally get a gun, which was why Colin led this movement, and there were tens of thousands of people who signed petitions to ask Jim Lehrer to simply ask a question about gun violence in Colorado. He didn't. But... On Democracy Now!, we did expand the debate. You know, it's the, we call it the gated debate at the University of Denver, where Mitt Romney and President Obama stood at podiums, and that day we got a Comcast studio very nearby. By the way, folks are handing out the Daily Digest, and I hope you do sign up. It lets you know the uh, news headlines of the day and what we cover each day. And, um, and also we send you media alerts, and it's a great way just to stay in touch until the next time we come back when I can't wait to visit KCAI and KCUI and maybe go on the air there and have conversations with folks as we did this morning on KDUR, and then we'll just be celebrating, we'll just be having to pay the electricity bill unless... Um, you guys are like the, what we just passed, the greater world, where I think their entire utility bill for any house down the road, you all know this place where they make their houses out of uh, tin cans, and uh, it's amazing. Um, uh, used bottles and uh, used soda cans, uh, I think they, they will refund any money beyond uh, if you have to pay more than $100 a year for your utilities. Um, but I can't wait to come and celebrate that. 
Um, so we broadcast from a Comcast facility down the road from the University of Denver. And we opened up the debate. We looked online how the workers were setting up the University of Denver, and they were putting up these light blue, sort of dark blue striped, I think it was the Constitution or something written on them, behind what would be the debate that night. And we looked at the podiums. We got two podiums similar to the ones the presidential candidates uh, were using. And we brought in the third-party presidential candidates. We brought in Jill Stein, the third-party presidential candidate, Rocky Anderson, you know, former mayor of Salt Lake City, the Justice Party presidential candidate. We'd invited Gary Johnson, the uh, libertarian candidate, your former governor. Um, he declined, but the point was, and this isn't about who you vote for, this is about expanding the debate. How is it that this, these debates now, are controlled no longer by the League of Women Voters, an independent body who ran these debates, but the control of these debates was wrested from the League when they refused to sign on to a secret contract several decades ago, a 12-page contract that the Democratic and Republican parties gave them, said, if you want to continue with these debates, instead of signing the contract, they held a news conference and released it to the press. That was the end of the League of Women Voters running these debates that are so important. Tens of millions of people watch. It's not about the candidates. It's about hearing ideas fully explored. Where we want to be in this country, who we want to be, what we want to represent to the rest of the world and to ourselves. And so the Commission on Presidential Debates was set up it was headed by Frank Farenkopf, then the head of the Republican Party, and Paul Kirk, the head of the Democratic Party, and now it's Mike McCurry, head of the, uh, uh, who is the, represents the Democrats, the former spokesperson for Bill Clinton, and Frank Farenkopf is still there as the head of the co-head of the Commission on Presidential Debates. It's a very good bet you won't hear third-party candidates, and Frank Farenkopf knows something about good bets. He's head of the American Gaming Association. Oh, and the debates are brought to you by the International Bottled Water Association and Bud Light and Heiser Busch. YWCA just pulled out. Um, they said they don't want to participate in these partisan affairs, and there's a growing citizen movement around this country to wrest back control of the debates, to make them truly impartial, so that the American people can determine what the rules are now. It's many more pages than 12-page secret contracts. Uh, some of the organizations that are involved with this are George Farah's Open Debates, if you want to just check out information about this. I was curious of that night. Um, either they, each of the candidates would have bottled water on the podiums, or maybe a little Bud Light. <laughs> so we had our podiums, and this is how we did it. Jim Lehrer welcomed everyone and asked the candidates about the economy. Two minutes for President Obama, when he was done two minutes for Mitt Romney, and then we stopped the tape. And we said, Dr. Jill Stein, you have two minutes on the economy. And then we went to Rocky Anderson, two minutes on the economy. And when that two minutes was up, we said, back to my colleague Jim Lehrer at the University of Denver. And that's the debate you heard for the evening. Breaking the sound barrier, that's what democracy sounds like. We broadcast from Blacksburg, Virginia. We flew to Denver and we brought you that debate. Um, and this weekend was the 11th anniversary of the war in Afghanistan, the longest war in U.S. history. So on Friday morning, we broadcast from Colorado Springs, from the new Tim Gill Center for Public Media, part of Rocky Mountain PBS. And we brought in David Phillips, who wrote the book Lethal Warriors, about a unit from Fort Carson that went to Iraq, came back, went to Iraq, came back. The murder rate at Fort Carson, 114 times the murder rate in surrounding Colorado Springs because as these men came back, they couldn't switch, the, turn the kill button off. They were killing their girlfriends, they were killing their wives, they were killing other soldiers, they were killing people they didn't even know in Colorado Springs. They didn't know how to turn it off. And you can imagine when they were in Iraq, 
who it was they were killing. The reverberations of war, of violence, we will feel for a very long time to come, and the war is still going on. We also had Anthony uh, Andrew Paganian. He was an Iraq War veteran, and now he he counsels soldiers. He is the first soldier since world since the Vietnam War to be charged with cowardice. It wasn't a few days that he was in Iraq and he was given that anti-malaria drug, Larium. And then he saw a Bradley tank explode in Iraqi. And he could not handle this. He started to break down and he asked a commanding officer for help and they charged him with cowardice. If you are found guilty of cowardice in the military, you can be put to death. He was exonerated. These are the stories we don't know. We broadcast that story from Colorado Springs, and then we went back to Denver. In the afternoon, I was invited on Al Jazeera English, actually, in the uh, news hours, the PBS News Hour studios in Denver. I was invited to have a dialogue with David Weston, the former head of ABC World News, tonight. Uh, he just retired about a year ago, so he's there through the invasion of Iraq um, and, well, beyond in both wars. So the moderator asked us about the coverage of the debates, and then we went on to talk about the war, and he said that they're very fair in covering these issues, and they bring in all the different points of view. And I said, oh, really, to David Weston. I said, let's go back to 2003, six weeks before the invasion of Iraq, Let's look at the study that FAIR did, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, FAIR.org, that looked at the two weeks around Colin Powell, then Secretary of State, giving his push for war at the UN. It was February 5th, 2003. And General Powell had a lot of credibility. He was really hesitant about the war, um, as half the population was in this country. <clears throat> but he then went to the global stage and said the evidence was in. Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction and was preparing to use them against us. That was the final nail in the coffin for so many. So that two-week period was very important six weeks before the U.S. invaded Iraq because, as Noam Chomsky says, the media manufactures consent. Manufactures consent for war. So Fair looked at the four major nightly newscasts, ABC World News Tonight, run by David Weston, CBS Evening News, NBC Nightly News, and the PBS News Hour with Jim Lehrer. In that two-week period, six weeks before the war, right around Colin Powell's address at the UN, there were 393 interviews done around war. Guess how many were with anti-war leaders? Half the population is against the war at that point. Three. Three of almost 400. That is no longer mainstream media. That's an extreme media beating the drums for war. And that's what I said on Al Jazeera English. And David Weston responded, it might surprise you to know, Amy, that I agree with you. And that did surprise me. And he said he will forever regret that, you remember Peter Jennings, who died of lung cancer, the anchor of the ABC World News Tonight. He said, Peter did not buy the weapons of mass destruction argument. But I prevailed upon him to back off. He said we were under a lot of pressure. I just want to say that this is why we need independent media, why we must build independent media all over this country, but what we, we must also pressure the corporate media because it has so much reach and they may be private corporations that run these networks, but they are using an invaluable public resource, the national airways. And if they don't use them responsibly, they should have their licenses revoked. Because... <laughs> the lies take lives. Now, I really do think 
that those who are deeply concerned about war, and I include in that many soldiers and veterans, you know, they've seen it firsthand. Those who are concerned about the growing inequality in this country, those who are concerned about the wildfires from Colorado to Utah, the drenching rains in Louisiana and Florida, the dust bowl conditions of the Midwest, climate change. Those who are concerned about the fate of the earth are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take it back. There's so much to talk about. Um, my brother and I, David, um, wrote a few books together. The first called The Exception to the Rulers, and the reason we call it that is that's what the media should be. The Exception to the Rulers, that's the motto of democracy now. The second book we wrote is called Static, and the reason we called it Static is in this high-tech digital age with high-definition television and digital radio, still all we ever get is static. That veil of distortion and lies and misrepresentations and half-truths that obscure reality. When what we need the media to give us is the dictionary definition of static. Criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history. Movements. That's what we need the media to cover. And the media denigrates movements. And so let's talk about some of those movements. And we don't have to go very far back in time, but I will go way back and we will stay in this past year. I mean, the Egyptian Revolution, the Arab Spring, right? The Tunisian Revolution was sparked by a young man named Mohamed Bouazizi. He comes out of university, gets no opportunity, goes into the marketplace to sell fruits and vegetables. He's harassed by the authorities. They take a scale. He is so deeply frustrated, he sets himself on fire, and that sparks the Tunisian Revolution. It ignited a generation of frustration. And something else sparked the Tunisian Revolution, WikiLeaks. The WikiLeaks whistleblower website that released so many millions of documents, whether it was Iraq war logs or Afghan war logs or the State Department cables that U.S. government officials wrote. And why would that have anything to do with the Arab Spring? Well, like, for example, in Tunisia, you know, they talked about the corrupt and brutal dictator, the State Department cables. Now, it's not as if the people of Tunisia didn't know that about Ben Ali, their leader. Not their leader, but he was ruling them. Um, it's just that they understood then that the U.S. understood how corrupt and brutal he was, and yet they were shoring him up to the tune of millions of dollars every year. And that just infuriated them further. And then that sparked the Egyptian Revolution. How many of you have experienced the Egyptian Revolution through the reporting of my colleague at Democracy Now! Sharif Del Bridge? I mean, Sharif's amazing. When this all happened uh, in January of 2011, Sharif's getting texts from his family, from his friends. People are saying, I'm going to die for my country. And he's going, what the hell? He's saying, these are not political people who are writing to him. And he's saying, my country is really changing. And he flies right home into Cairo, no, right into Tahrir, right? And he didn't leave virtually for 18 days. And the reporting he brought you, well, first Mubarak plunged Egypt into digital darkness, right? He turned off the internet. Actually, he didn't do it by himself. He used a U.S. company named Naris. It's based in California. And they flipped the switch. And when there was global outcry the next day, they had to issue a press release. And they said, we were only following orders, but we've heard that before. Um, and Sharif, at this time, you know, Democracy Now! is just pioneered from the beginning because necessity is the mother of invention. We couldn't afford the satellite, so we made our way through the internet. And, well, well, Sharif, when the internet is down, becomes one of the top tweeters in the world because he figures out a way around the blockade. And then the thugs brought down the satellites. Now, this is a problem for the major networks. This is how they transmit their videos, their reports. And they brought up the internet, but they brought down the satellites. So 
Um, I remember seeing Anderson Cooper in his hotel room on uh, sort of a foggy kind of Skype connection. Uh, it looked like sort of old democracy now with a lower third that said reporting from an undisclosed location. There was Sharif in the middle of Tahrir saying exactly where he was and who he was and saying this is the safest place to be in all of Egypt. Sharif, a very illustrious um, uh, son of Egypt, his grandfather, the most famous raider in Egypt, Hassan Abdel Qadus. Um, and he is reporting, and he is interviewing people. Um, his cameraman is our video producer, Hani Masood, also Egyptian-American. He leaps tall buildings in a single bound. He played on the equivalent of the Egyptian national basketball team. You want him in your so at your side in times of trouble. And he is there, and he is filming Sharif interviewing people throughout Tahrir. And then he leaps over burning barricades and gets around the camels brought in to crush the people, goes back to Sharif's family house, and he is bringing us these 20, putting together these 20, 25 minute reports on the internet. He is, rather, 20, 25 minute video reports, sending them through the internet, and we are broadcasting them the next day when the networks are sort of on Skype or just showing you the bird's eye view, which was pretty impressive, of Tahrir. And you were meeting Adef Suef, the great Egyptian writer who wrote Map of Love. You were meeting Nawal Sadawi, the 79-year-old former presidential candidate, psychiatrist, author of many books, had been imprisoned under Sadat, had been exiled under Mubarak, who was leading salons before Tahrir, uh, talking to the young people who were very discouraged, saying, we will win, we will win. And you were hearing from the young woman, the high school student, who was putting out a broadsheet in Tahrir called Voices of Tahrir, this in the shadow of the the state media building that had spewed lies for so many decades. And then Sharif was being interviewed on all of the networks, not just on Democracy Now!, but on MSNBC, NBC, CNN, right in the middle of Tahrir. We call this trickle-up journalism. <laughs> and, then, and then from Egypt, we moved to Wisconsin, right? <laughs> Really, I mean, I think Wisconsin was partly inspired by the Arab Spring, by the possibility of change. I mean, democracy now covering movements. We flew right into Madison, to the Capitol, and they've taken over the state Capitol building. I mean, there are 150,000 people who march on the coldest days, and they're pretty cold in Wisconsin. The largest protests in Wisconsin history. I remember going into the state Capitol and seeing the biggest guys I have ever seen, the Oshkosh prison guards. And I went up to them, I said, who'd you vote for? They said, Governor Walker. Oh, I should say it was not only Arab Spring that inspired Wisconsin, it was the Wisconsin Governor Scott Walker, <laughs> right, who gets elected and then goes after teachers, goes after the public unions, tries to eviscerate their cup collective bargaining rights, and people haven't counted on this. And so these Oshkosh guards, I say, who did you vote for? They say, Governor Walker, of course. So I said, so what are you doing here? They said, protesting Governor Walker, of course. <laughs> I said, well, why? I said, he didn't say he was going to go after our wives, our neighbors. This is our community. And then I remember on a really cold day with everyone outside, this guy, older gentleman with glasses on, walking through the snow with a sign that said, IRS Auditors Against Walker. <laughs> And just to show how profound these uprisings are, I mean, I went up in a crane just to get that bird's eye view. And, you know, looking across at the History Museum across from the State Capitol in Madison and Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin has great labor archives. And to show how profound these uprisings are in the continuum, um, right, they're trying to protect public unions. Ask me, the American Federation of State County, County Municipal Employees. But this isn't just a bureaucratic thing, right? Ask me was founded in... Wisconsin in 1932. Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated April 4th, 1968 in Memphis, Tennessee. Do you remember what he was doing there? He had gone to Memphis simply to march with sanitation workers who were trying to organize Local 1707 of AFSCME. This is a continuum. And so we go from Wisconsin to Occupy to the whole Occupy Wall Street movement, right? 
September 17th, we just passed the anniversary. Thousands of people march on Wall Street and they end up at Zuccotti Park, Liberty Square, Liberty Plaza, and the media won't cover them, right? We live in the media metropolis in the world in New York. It's just down the road, but they won't cover them. It is silence. Day after day after day after day. I thought, how long can the silence, of course, we were covering them before. We cover grassroots movements. We knew something was percolating and then we cover them through it. And when are they going to start covering? Then they did. You know, I mean, after a week or so, they, they cannot not cover this. And then they start to ridicule them, right? I remember watching the morning networks right before he's doing Democracy Now. It's always inspiring uh, to look at the networks and how they're covering or not covering issues. And I remember seeing one morning conversation between the pundits, these pundits who know so little about so much explaining the world to us and getting it so wrong. And they're saying, who are these people? I mean, they cannot even get it together enough to come up with one demand. It's like every demand under the sun, every sign. If they could get it together to choose a spokesperson, we'd have them right here. Really. They really, the Occupy movement had no message. I think any Madison Avenue PR exec would have drooled to be the one credited with the slogan, we are the 99%. Has there ever been a more successful slogan in U.S. history that reverberated across the political spectrum? And the word occupy has occupied the language, not only in the United States, not only English, but in languages it is known all over the world. And all these different movements that they represent, you know, they can't get it together, I think that's its power. I mean, think about all the signs that people carried. Um, you know, and all the movements that fueled Occupy. Right before, like a week or two before, 1,200 people had been arrested, forming a ring around the Rose Garden in Washington, D.C., around the White House, demanding that President Obama stop the Keystone XL tar sands pipeline. <laughs> That was organized by indigenous leaders from Canada, 350.org, and other organizations. And then they came north to New York. They were part of that movement. And there were other signs that were held. Like, um, um, oh, I remember once, I mean, oh, well, just let me say one thing about the pizza. So there are a lot of pizzerias around Zuccotti, and of course, and people from all over the world, a lot of Egyptians were calling into the pizzerias to order pizzas to be sent to Zuccotti Park so that the occupiers would be fed. And I mean, there was so much pizza flying into this park. They had these huge buffets for um, people. You'd see hundreds of people lined up, and I'm not kidding you, a, a number of, and this is next to Wall Street, bankers are lined up because they appreciate a free lunch. So. <laughs> So um, they line up, and everyone eats the pizza pies. They call them occupies. And then they take the cardboard boxes. They are conservationists, absolutely. They use every aspect of what they are given, and they take the tops of the pizza bottoms, pop, pop, the pizza boxes and the bottoms, and they make signs out of them. And they said things like, um, um, I'll believe corporations are people when Texas executes yes. one. Extremely clever, but let's now talk about the real thing. Another series of signs that people carried into Occupy Wall Street, into the encampment, were ones that said, too much doubt, and I am Troy Davis. Now, I just wanted to read a little bit. We have a whole section on the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Troy Davis and the politics of death. Troy Davis and the machinery of death. And I just wanted to read you a little. So it was September 17th, people occupied Wall Street. And then September 21st, Troy Davis was scheduled to die. Who was Troy Davis? On September 21st at 7 p.m.